that's a picture of our group. It's before the pandemic and on a nice sunny day. Sunny day, so at the moment I'm sitting in front of a computer, not an island, and also it's raining here. So anyway, good to have afterwards a glass of whiskey, I would say. <laughs> okay, and also good, of course, to go back to science and think about and review some of the things that we are doing. So in our group, we are a group of physicists, physicists and we are doing material physics related to flexible electronics transducers. So typical devices are shown here that we developed. For example, we have flexible ionizing radiation sensors or stretchable devices for bioelectronics. And of course, you can imagine that you cannot achieve such features with typical rigid CMOS-based electronics, but you need new materials that can adapt, adapt to strains, surface strains, when materials are stretched or when they are continuously moved, right? And uh, so we have to tune a lot of these um, electronic material properties, and in particular regard their uh, micromechanics. So one of the typical experiments that we can do, for example, is shown here, where we have a semiconducting synth film, and then we investigate with scanning probe microscopies how it breaks. Now, when you go towards flexible and wearable electronics, of course, one of the issues that you are dealing with is, of course, power supply. And one major objective in this field is to achieve uh, something that is called an electromechanical energy harvester, which is a device which basically, which basically harvests all the mechanical energy present due to movements of the body and translated in some electrical energy. And of course, this relates to uh, piezoelectric materials. And of course, it's also related for strain sensors and, and other electromechanical sensors. Uh, one of the very um, most used materials in this field is this PVDF. So this is a polymer material. So it's very nice um, to um, prepare large homogeneous films of it, which you then can directly contact with two electrodes and you stretch or bend the device and then you can measure these voltage signals, measure current output and, and, and quantify just the electromechanical power conversion efficiency. Of course, now the big question is like you have this material PVDF, but the question is, of course, are there any ways to improve this transduction probability by introducing nanostructures? And on the slide here, you can already see that these are uh, mainly uh, followed by introducing such nanofibers. Nanofibers of this PVDF polymer can be easily produced by a technique that is called electrospinning. So it's a technique where you have basically a solution containing the polymer that is ejected through a very small needle in the presence of a very high um, electric field. And the electric field ac accelerates the solution, the solution evaporates, a remaining polymer fiber remains, it spins around and is then deposited onto the surface. Here you can see a SEM image of such a sample. And again, such a sample, you can then contact it with just two metallic layers. You apply a force and then you can measure the voltage that is generated. And with such a sample, although of course you use, you use much less material as it's, it's, it's a very porous material, so most of it is just air between these fibers. So even though it's much less material, you obtain a better transduction efficiency. And the question is of course, how is it possible? What's the particular property of this nanofiber that improves this efficiency? And we try to address this question by, um, electrostatic force microscopy methods. So one is the piezoelectric force microscopy in order to understand whether the piezoelectric properties of this polymer are maintained or even improved, improved when you produce it in such a nanofiber structure. So that was one question. And the other techniques that we apply is Kelvin probe force microscopy. And this is mostly because we were interested in finding out whether the technique introduces some particular space charges on the fibers because space charges is something that relates to electrodes. So um, space charges, space charged membranes, for example, are the ones that are used in microphones, right? So their vibration introduces an electric field, which then is just creates displacement currents and uh, again, uh, transduce mechanical uh, signals, right? So uh, second technique in order to quantify just local charge entities. All right, so we start with the very first sample, which is just a synfilm sample annealed on, uh, on a gold surface. And um, you can do these um, quite nice PFM experiments 
where you uh, observe on the surface the PFM amplitude. You can see the nice domain structures. You can see the domain walls. You can see that you have different polarizations. And of course, with uh, such a material, you will then start to do the PFM hysteresis loops. And here comes the first problem. And that's the fact that, uh, is that in, in such a polymer, of course, you have an elastic material. So you have a lot of electrostatic forces in particular when you apply the DC field. So that is, um, what we've seen in the talks also before. So that's basically an artifact in, in, in PFM measurements. And, um, and you have to get rid, of course, of these and think about this artifact and when you characterize such a material. A way to do so is by doing switching spectroscopy. So you only apply the DC field in a short pulse in order to polarize the material. And then in the absence of the electric field, you just do the AC measurement in order to obtain the phase and the amplitude. And by doing that, you can get the nice quantitative results, which match to the, um, for example, X-ray um, characterization of the piezoelectric coefficient. And most of all, also, you see that the phase signal completely changes signs. So here we have a material which has a negative piezoelectric coefficient. And with PFM, we, find, we get this correct finding. All right, good. Of course, it gets, it gets then more complicated when you do this experiment on such fibers because they are in diameter, of course, thicker than the thin films. And um, so here you see such a typical sample. We can produce them with different polarities of the high voltages. Of course, we produce them on uh, metallic substrates in order to have a back electrode, or we can also do this on, on silicon wafers with a the thermal oxide. Here you can see a an, an PFM experiment done on a gold surface on such a fiber. Um, just as it was produced and you see that there is no particular PFM amplitude that distinguishes this material. So it's clearly not polarized. There is no significant PFM signal. You can only achieve that when you apply high voltages. I mean, here we are talking about 400 nanometer thick fibers. So it's clear that you have to go to the range of high voltage PFM. And when you do so, you can polarize it. Okay, um, you can do, of course, characteristic experiments and quantify these fibers. And what you find out is that their properties the piezoelectric properties are very similar to the synthon. Now it gets more interesting when you go to the KPFM experiments. And here are some images obtained directly after the deposition. And you can see that you have this large buildup of negative charge on the fibers. It's a charge that with time dissipates. And um, it's also a charge that increases with the fiber diameter. So it's something that is trapped inside the volume of these fibers, as we can find out with these experiments. Uh, what is then interesting, of course, when you also look at the long limit, what happens to these fibers is that you have an additional effect that comes basically from the surface of such fluorinated materials, because on whichever surface you put PVDF in whichever configuration in P KPFM measurement, you'll always find a slightly negative um, charge that is presented in such materials. So um, as the time is short, let me then directly go to my conclusions that like what explains this efficiency in, in, in these um, piezoelectric PVDF fiber networks in, in, in electromechanical construction. So to explain this, we first have to think about like how our charge is introduced in this material. We can exclude any polling due to the deposition technique. The field is probably not strong enough to polarize the fibers when they arrive on the surface. But what, we are, what is present are on the one hand triboelectric surface charges and electro spinning space trap charges, which of course at a certain time scale disappear. Now, when you then um, put electrodes in close vicinity to such a fiber network, what happens is that basically you have such a capacitive structure. Now, if you change the distances due to the moving fibers when you compress the old system, of course, then you have displacement currents. And this is basically what creates your signal. So it's not a piezoelectric effect, but it's just effect due to the space charges present in such systems, either due to trap charges or triboelectric effects. And that's how we can then explain the improved efficiency in, in, in electromechanical construction of such fibers. All right, with that, I'm at the end of my talk. I hope that I stayed in the time. Let me thank all my collaborators. And of course, later in the chat room, I am open for questions.